Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Theological Arsonist. I am joined by my friend Joshua Janier today. Um, I'm so grateful for his willingness to come on and uh, share his wisdom um, on a very, very important topic. But before we get to that topic, I do want to say if my show, if my podcast, my ministry has benefited you in any way, um, I have a Patreon page. And on that page, you can support the ministry and in turn receive access to things exclusive to those who are supporters on Patreon. So make sure you do that. It's down in the description as well as linked in my YouTube cover photo. Um, so, and if you're listening, um, I will include links somewhere. So you can look for that. But anyways, Joshua, my friend, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. It's great to have you here. Uh, Joshua and me, we met, honestly, it was really through Andrew who kind of linked us up through our mutual love of Reformed theology and specifically post-millennial eschatology is kind of how we got linked up. Um, so Joshua was a dear brother of mine. I'm really grateful that he's here to talk with me today. Um, we're going to be talking about justification through faith alone and the history behind that, as well as why that is so, so, so essential to the Christian faith. And so before we get into the topic, though, Joshua, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, help, help my listeners to get to know you a bit. Yes, of course. Um, I'm Joshua Janier. I'm 17 years old. I'm still in high school. I'll be graduating this year. Um, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, got into Reformed theology about a year ago. Um, I'm super passionate for God's word. Just, you know, it's always searching the scriptures. And um, I do apologetics on TikTok, um, presuppositional apologetics, urban apologetics, about everything on TikTok. I, I touch about every topic, Roman Catholicism. Um, but that's that's what I do. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about making a YouTube channel, start posting content. But you can find me on TikTok at Joshua Janier and, and Instagram at Joshua Janier. Cool. And we'll have all that linked down below so you guys can easily access his stuff. Uh, phenomenal apologetics, by the way. I'm, I'm blown away, especially at 17. The fact that you're doing what you're doing is just so encouraging to my soul. So we're talking about justification through faith alone. Um, one of the five solas, one of the very important of the five solas. And so, uh, Josh, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Start us out anywhere you'd like on this subject, and we'll just kind of have a dialogue. Yeah, I want to. I want to read two passages: Romans one and Galatians one. Um, just just parts of those passages. Let me know when you get there, yep. and then we can we can pray before we read. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm there, Romans one. All right. Um, Father God, we thank you that we can come together and, and discuss your beautiful gospel. Keep me from error, O oh God. Allow me to speak with clarity to defend the truth of your word. Um, allow, your, allow these words to be yours and not my own. Holy Spirit, aid me. Help us to understand. Give us clarity, O oh God. We delight in you, Father God, and we want to defend your gospel because it's the only good news that we have. And we pray in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <sighs> okay, Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was descended and declared to be the and, and was and was declared to be the Son of God in the power according in, 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 in the, I'm so sorry. Declared to be the Son of God in the power according to the Spirit of Holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, this is this is such a beautiful passage. I mean, I'm quoting Dr. Sproul, but the, the grammar that, that Paul uses here is that of the possessive genitive, mm -hmm. that this gospel of God, it doesn't belong to us. It's, it's God's gospel, and um, it's the resurrection. You know, the resurrection is linked to our justification, and because Christ rose from the dead, we receive the benefits of his perfect work. And I just want to read verse 16 to get the theme of this whole, this whole epistle. Mm -hmm. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God of salvation the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's basically the theme of the whole letter, the righteousness of God, that in the gospel, a righteousness that sinners don't have inherently is given from God and it's given by faith. And I just want to turn to Galatians 1, just set the theme. Galatians 1, verse 8. 
You there? Yep, I'm there. Okay. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Um, this is this is a beautiful passage. Um, Paul, you know, the you know the literary device, you know, in 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 the Jewish culture, literary device, you know, to emphasize something is you would repeat it. You know, that's why Jesus says, "Amen, amen." Verily, 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 I say to you. So this he repeats it twice. And if anybody is to preach another gospel, let him be anathema. Let him be a curse. May the curse of God fall on him. And you know, this 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 doctrine of justification by faith, um, it is it is essential to understanding the gospel. You know. As Martin in, in Martin Luther's hymn, like goods and kindreds go, you know, these this it's like, you know, other things we can we can, you know, it's adiopera, we can disagree on, but this is essential to understanding the gospel. And Christians are called to lay down their life for something like this, just as the martyrs did in the sixteenth century. You know, Calvin said that this 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 is this doctrine has to be treated with kit with care and gentleness. Luther said that this is the article of faith upon which the church stands or falls. And but what we see in the 16th century, what we see in the 16th century or the medieval ages leading up to the Reformation is we see the subjugation of the scriptures under the authority of the magistery, which is now the Roman Catholic Church, because yeah. Roman, Roman Catholicism was foreign in the early centuries. And of course, we have problems like we have, you have the Arian heresy, the Nestorian heresy. But we, we, see, but we see in, in like in the medieval ages, the subjugation of scripture that, you know, the abuse of the papacy. Yeah. And what, what we see leading up to the Reformation is that this is what Roman Catholics taught, that, that the instrument used for our justification was infant baptism. Yeah. That infant baptism will put you on the root of justification. And you're not, you're not it's, be, it's because what's inherently in you, that you're infused with grace and you, there's grace in you, but now you have to maintain that state of grace. Right. It's like kind of like a treadmill. And what we see, you know, the, the, you know, Luther's stories is so beautiful. You know, Luther was a student of law. You know, before he went into to the monastery, he's already established himself as one of the smartest minds in Germany. And, you know, Luther applied his studies of law to the law of God. You know, we, we, we know the story, Luther's testimony in 1505. He goes out during a thunderstorm, you know, you know, you know a, a thunderbolt's about him and he cries out, St. Anne, help me and I'll become a monk. So he goes into an Augustinian monastery. And yeah, your father talked about it two weeks ago that, you know, Luther struggled with depression and mm -hmm. you know, he would be in confessions for like four hours. And, you know, Lu you know, the, Dr. Sproul, he calls it the, the insanity of Luther. You know, people ask Luther, do you love God? And he was like, I hate God. I hate the God who condemns sinners. And he, Luther felt like he was a, a monk above reproach, but he still felt as he was a sinner. And we, we don't see Luther's conversion truly until one year before the Reformation, before the starting of the Reformation, October 31st, 1516. You know, he's um, Luther's tasked to give some lectures and he's tasked to give a lecture on the book of Romans. And he's meditating on Romans 1 and he read the passage we just read. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. And then he's, he, he sees an Augustinian, um, he sees an, um, an Augustine document in the end. Martin Luther has already read this passage like this is the righteousness of God that he condemns sinners. This is God that he is righteous. But Augustine writes in a, in a document, he says, no, this is not the righteous that God is righteous. It is a righteousness given to sinners by God. Mm. And Luther says it was though as the gates of paradise swung open and he was born again and he walked straight in. And, you know, we see the, the starting of the Reformation one year later. But I'll just stop there if you have any more questions. Yeah, no, I just I just want to go back to what you said about Romans chapter one, I think that, that that's something I honestly have never picked up on that idea of the gospel has that possessive nature where it's God's gospel, you know? And so that, that puts into perspective, I think the idea um, that I, I, I love, you know, the sovereignty of God that I think so many people don't fully grasp or understand is when we're talking about the gospel, we're not talking about something we have, we're talking about something that God has that he has sovereignly gifted to us, you know, and so it, it goes right along with that idea that there's nothing we can add. There's nothing we can add. There's nothing we can do. Um, it's, it's fully 100% in his hands given to us. And so what a comfort that is, honestly. And I, I, I love that, that idea of Luther, um, you know, feeling like the gates of paradise had opened mm -hmm. because truly 
when I, when I pause and I sit and I think about my sin and I think about <laughs> all the struggles I have um, in the flesh, if, if there was any point that I needed to rely on my own works or my own maintaining of grace in my life, I, there, there's no hope. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. And so my heart breaks for the, the Roman Catholics and their doctrines because the, they, they've, they've put on themselves an impossible task. They've put on themselves an absolutely impossible task. And that, that impossible task comes from the fact that they, it show the fact that they think that what they're doing is correct shows that they don't understand the holiness of God. Yeah. <laughs> As R.C. Sproul said, you know, and I, I love that man to death. You know, we don't know who God is. <laughs> we don't know who exactly. God is. We don't know who we are. And so establishing that is so important to really not only, not only understand justification by faith alone, but, but understand why that is absolutely essential to grasping the gospel. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's so true. You know, um, I, I love the, the passage in Isaiah, you know, where he sees Christ on his throne after the death of King Uzziah, you know, and his garment fills the whole, the whole temple. And then Isaiah, you know, the, the angels say, holy, 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 you know, that is the only time where God's, where an attribute of God is taken to the third degree. You know, it doesn't say God is love, love, love. God is mercy, mercy, mercy. God is holy, holy, holy. And then Isaiah, you know, he puts a woe on himself, which is a curse. Yeah. You know, what, what we see here is like Isaiah didn't know who Isaiah was until he knew who God was. And until we know that, I mean, until we fully, I don't, I don't think we can ever fully grasp how holy God is. But if I know how unholy I am, I know, I know justification by faith is essential. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So let, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's talk about the, this idea. Luther discovered this incredible truth through, through Augustine. Mm -hmm. and, um, and through the Reformation, we ultimately, the purpose of the Reformation was not to move and become a separate entity from the Catholic Church, but really to yes. say we are the Catholic Church. We are yes. the true church that is going back to the roots of what is historic biblical Christianity. And so let's talk a little bit about that and how that has sprung into what is now known as justification by faith alone. Yeah, that's so true. If we, if we read the writings of the, the reformers, they always re really reference themselves as the Catholic Church and the church, and they, they separated themselves from the Church of Rome because they believed that the Church of Rome. And, you know, most people believe that, oh, the, you know, the reformers, you know, that justification by faith was a novelty that was dropped in the 16th century, that it just, you know, came out of Luther's mind when that's not the case. Right. You know, people, you know, people said, oh, you're, you're, you're diverting from historic Christianity. Nobody in the early church believed that when that's really not the case. Of course, it was not professed in such a way that the reformers had to because it wasn't laws. You know, that wasn't a question in the early centuries of the church. Um, people think that the reformers were against the church fathers. Like Calvin writes in the preface to his institutes that he wasn't against the church fathers, that the church fathers would agree with what they're doing. And we just see, you know, the diversion from scripture. That's why Calvin said post tembras lux that 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 the gospel was lost. It was lost in darkness. You know, most people think that you know reformed theology just has to do with predestination. That the whole you know the Reformation was based on pre. And then at the heart of the Reformation is the rediscovery of the gospel, yep. the, the gospel of God, and and that that is that is why I love reformed theology. That is why I'm a Reformation nerd because without it, where would we be? You know, if God didn't raise up these men sovereignly, you know, by the grace of God, raising up these men to fight against error, where would we be? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let's, let's touch on that because I think that that's really huge. Where in history do we see this idea of faith alone? Because I think a lot of people do have this idea that, oh, Martin Luther was the one who kind of came up with that. It was, it was him. And before that, it's always been something that, different. But obviously, Martin Luther thought very, very strongly that no, this is not new. I'm reclaiming what is the true gospel of old. And so, where do we where do we see that taught in the early church? Well, well, first in the in the pages of scripture, in the pages of scripture. But you know, Catholics they they have a low view of scripture. But we can go to historic Christianity. I'll read you um, Clement of Rome. Um, the Catholics um, they they consider Clement of Rome to be the fourth pope. 
Um, this is what Clement of Rome writes in um, AD 100. So we having been called through his will in Christ Jesus are not justified through ourselves or through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works that we have done in holiness of heart, but through faith by which the almighty God has justified all who, all who have existed from the beginning to whom be the glory forever and ever. And then I'll just read you Polycarp. Um, Though you have not seen him, you believe in him with an inexpressible and glorious joy, which many desire to experience, knowing that by grace you have been saved, not because of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. We, we, see, it, we see it all, all throughout, all throughout historic Christianity that the church fathers, all, like Augustine, Polycarp, Ignatius, they, they all taught justification by faith. Right. You know, of course, it wasn't it wasn't professed in such an like such a way that it had to be in the 16th century, but it's pretty obvious that they this was this was you know this the whole church agreed that we're justified by faith, and yeah. that's that's why that's why the the reformers said that we are the Catholic Church because Catholic all it means is universal. They yeah. said they are the Roman Church. Yeah. yeah. So so with that right, we we see those things and those obviously the profession of faith alone. Um, mm -hmm. comes from scripture ultimately sola scriptura yes. right that's that's yes. the ultimate it's not about who said it in history it's about what does scripture actually say and one of the arguments i hear from catholics a lot and it's a redundant and quite <laughs> um i don't want to be insultive here but a very a very weak argument is the words faith alone don't ever show up in scripture and so we we just read a few different passages but let, let's go even deeper and see what is it, where, where in scripture is this taught explicitly, where in scripture is this taught? And then eventually I want to take us to probably one of the fundamental debates between this, which is James talking about uh, yeah. works, the idea of works. And so I, I want to go a little bit into that because I think it's important to clarify the context of that for people who yes. may be easily uh, thrown off by that. I mean, yes, we, we see it. Um, most people think that Jesus didn't teach sola fide. We see that in Luke 18, that the tax collector that cling to the mercy of God left justified, left declared righteous. Yes. And we see in Romans 3, I'll let you get there, Romans 3, verse 28. I am there, sir. Okay, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is, not, is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? On the contrary, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So there's, I believe there's three questions I asked, you know. There, what becomes our boasting? You know, Paul answers what becomes our boasting in Romans 4. And then there's another, there's another question that is asked, is God the God of the Jews only? No, he's not. He shows that Abraham was justified prior to circumcision so he can be the father of the uncircumcised and the circumcised. So Paul answers that question in Romans 4. And then do we then overthrow the law by the faith? And then in Romans 6, he says, by no means shall we continue to sin that grace may abound by no means. So I, I love to see that. I didn't notice that, that Paul really, he, he lays out these three questions. He answers them there, but he goes, he goes into them deeply in Romans 4 and Romans 5 and Romans 6. I don't, I don't know how a Catholic can read the, 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 the writings of Paul um, and, and think that their gospel saves. I mean, Rome's gospel does not give somebody peace with God. And because if, if you commit a mortal sin, you, you, I mean, you can be justified today. And if you commit a mortal sin, you fell off justification and you have to do penance because penance is a restorative cause for those who have made shipwreck of their souls. So it's just literally just a treadmill on and on, no assurance. And that is why, I mean, I didn't get into it, but in the 16th century where we see um, the writing of the 95 Theses, Martin Luther was still a lover of the church. He still loved the church. He still, he still believed in, in the Holy Catholic Church. We can read the Theses and the Martin Luther siding with some Catholic teaching, but we see the abuse of indulgences, you know, and Martin Luther thought indulgences was a good idea. The Roman Catholic Church, they taught that an indulgence was only valuable if the sinner had a repentant heart that if you, came, if you came with a humble heart the pope was pretty clear about that the reason why they started selling indulgences is because they, the, the building of saint peter's basilica in the 16th century oh you there bro i think
think I made. But w- why Luther wrote his thesis? There was a man named Johann Tetzel, and he, he would say that, that, that God would forgive you of your sins. It doesn't matter if you have a repentant heart. It doesn't matter if you have a humble heart. God will just forgive you of your sins. And in Rome, they have something called the Treasury of Merits that they still affirm to this day. Um, the Treasury of Merits that like they, uh, a saint named St. Teresa, she died with too much merit. So they put some of her merit in the Treasury of Merits. So in order for somebody to have their sins forgiven, they would have to, the, the, the Pope would write a papal indulgence, giving somebody merit. That's why they, it's called super erogatory works, like super works that all these saints, including Jesus Christ, they died with too much merit that can be added to our account. Mm-hmm. So that's that we, we see the abuse of these indulgences because of Johann Tetzel. We went on to the peasants and Martin Luther, when he wrote his theses, he wasn't vandalizing. That's that, that was a practice done in the 16th century. He wrote it in Latin. So only the scholars of his day would read it because all he wanted was a discussion with the Catholic church because he was still a lover of the church. But what, what we see people were, were galvanized by it. And they started, they started writing it in Germany. They started writing it in German and then they sent it to everywhere. So people say, you know, the reformation happened by accident, but we know they didn't happen. That there's no, there's no such thing as an accident, mm-hmm. but that's what we see, you know, and Rome still affirms the, the treasury of merits. They still sell indulgences. They still sell these papal indulgences. And that's why we have, that's why they have purgatory because, you know, if you don't die with enough merit, you have to, you have to go through cleansing and then you can buy, you can buy merits for your, for your, your your relatives that are in purgatory but i mean that's 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 a silly teaching because that's that's nowhere that's it's it isn't found nowhere in the pages of scripture right and that again goes back to the idea of sola scriptura which they deny Mm -hmm. if we don't if we don't have the starting point of scripture then everything is arbitrary then there is no accountability for what they do of course you can't prove and say that it's wrong because again Mm -hmm. by what standard our standard is scripture that's where we need to start. But, but I, what, I, what I want to point out, too, is what's very interesting to me about this idea of the denial of faith alone within the Catholic Church is it's not just a denial of what I believe, as we've seen in Romans 3 and, and in other places, the clear teaching of Scripture. It's, it really, really, really destroys the purpose and the really the foundational reason for Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Because if we, if we don't recognize that it's by faith alone, and it's by the grace of God through faith, then as Paul says, you know, Christ died for no purpose. You know, mm-hmm. there, there's no purpose to that. So really what it does, if we try to add our works to it in any way, shape, or form, or merit, or even the idea of purgatory, right? The idea of purgatory is that, you need one final push of sanctification before you can step into the presence of God because you die still in sin. And so you need to be cleansed. Isn't that what Christ Jesus is for? Aren't we clothed in the righteousness of Christ? And so what it does is it demeans and it, and it undermines the very work of Jesus Christ. And so it's not a small error. And I want my listeners to know this. I mean, if you're a Catholic listener, you need to recognize that's not a small error. That's a huge distortion of the very nature of the gospel. And if you're somebody who's watching and you're just not quite sure about this whole faith alone thing, maybe it's new to you. You need to recognize how fundamental it is to the Christian yes. faith and how it, it's, it's essential. If we are to take the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ seriously— we also need to take faith alone in Jesus Christ seriously. Amen, brother. That's that's so true. I mean, I mean, for for the Catholic, Jesus Christ is very important. Um, you know, you know, we we have we have unity with Catholics on yes. the deity of Jesus Christ, but it's just you know they don't deny the importance of faith. It's the sufficiency of it. They don't deny the importance of grace. It's the sufficiency of that grace. Um, and that that's so true. I mean, Isaiah fifty three that the Messiah would come and justify the many. It, it literally, you know, because Jesus Christ for the Catholic, he opens the door of righteousness. That you and Jesus, you know, you're, you're cooperating on this mission to save, you know, you know, you're saying, you know, Jesus, yeah, he paid for my sin. But yeah, you know, I'm just cooperating with his grace. It, it, it does. You know, that's why Paul says if righteousness were through the law, Jesus died for nothing. Right. If, if like if, if that was the purpose, if, if, if God gave us the law so we can merit justification, that would have been so. Then Christ died for no purpose. But that's the reason why jesus just not only died but he also lived on our behalf and the, you know they, they don't teach the imputed righteousness of christ they teach the infused grace 
that you have to cooperate with. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it is, it is, I, I would understand why Luther went through depression and, and darkness. I mean, I, I, I it, it, it relates to me because, you know, you're, you, you're burdened, you know, with just with the law of God, with so much, so much pressure to with your performance and, all, and this, that, and the third, it's a burden. And, and that's, we're not, we're not, we're not even physically capable to keep the law because we're born in, in, in sin. We, yeah. we can't do it. We're not born in the state of innocence. We can't, we can't even keep the law, but you know, that that's, we see all these false religion because this is, this is what separates, it, you know, biblical Christianity from everything else. It is, you know, there's the, it's the deity of Christ and justification by faith that separates every, everything Christianity from every other religion. And you're, you're right. It really undermines. It just, you know, puts Jesus, you know, and, and God is not glorified. You know, God doesn't receive all the glory. God doesn't share his glory with anybody. And that is why the instrument, you know, first of all, salvation belongs to the Lord. And he defines on what terms you are to receive that salvation. What, how, how you're united to his son, Jesus Christ. And God has made it clear in the pages of scripture that that is by faith and by faith alone. You know, they, they affirm justification by faith, but it's not alone. Penance. You have to do your works, you know, confession. And it's, it's, it's really sad because, you know, I, I grew, I went to Catholic school for six years. I learned about all the sacraments, all the penance, all this, that, and the third. And it's honestly a burden. It's a burden. I mean, I, I would, my plea to my Catholic brothers and sisters is, you know, they love tradition, but why don't you read the writings of the church fathers and what they believed about justification by faith alone? It's, it's, it was an invention. It was a rediscovery of that, that essential doctrine to understanding the gospel. Right. Yeah, I would completely agree. And I, I do want to say that I have respect for my Catholic brothers and sisters. I don't ever want to come across as though I don't. I just, my, my heart is worried because I think that while the Catholic Church is definitely full of many true, true born again Christians, I truly believe that it is my opinion that they are, they are Christians, not because of the Catholic Church, but in spite of it. Um, you know, and, and so there, there are some serious errors that I, I think my, my biggest problem is that when we start to try to add anything to the work of Christ, we begin to have a low view of God's holiness and a high view of our ability to be righteous. And again, too, the, the idea of obedience, right? The idea of obeying Christ's commands and stuff, that comes not as an effort by us, but by a working of the Holy Spirit through us. So rather than the idea of becoming a Christian and then pursuing righteousness because that's what you're supposed to do, it's you become a Christian and then the righteousness flows out of you because it's not your own. You know, it's a totally different paradigm. And when you function with that source as being this is Christ working through me, and you're fixated on him rather than on the law and looking to try to obey the law, you end up obeying the law. You end up yeah. walking in obedience because of the source, right? And so yeah. that, that, that to me is just, it's so freeing. Like Luther said, it feels like yeah. the gates of paradise are open. And oh my goodness, when I stand before the throne of God one day, the only thing I'm going to do is fall to my knees and just thank him. <laughs> For his grace and his mercy and if i bring anything i think that anything i can do then let him condemn me <laughs> let him condemn me yeah brother I, I completely feel you know most people believe that you know the reformers were antinomianists they were that was definitely not the case you know yeah. martin luther writes in his commentary to the book of relations christians are not made righteous by doing righteous things being made righteous they now do righteous things Jesus Christ is, you know, what the Roman Catholic Church teaches that your sanctification is your justification, that your personal holiness has to do with your justification. But the reformers stress, to, you know, because the Bible does stress to distinguish these two parts of salvation. Justification is not sanctification. Justific you know, there's a quote by Luther, you know, if, if we're, not, you know, they, they said that if you have been justified, you will produce fruit. They, they did not deny the importance of good works. But that good works that comes after justification is not the basis of your justification. It's not the reason why you're justified, right. but it's, it is the fruit and the consequence. Right. Yeah. So, so from there, I think we'll, this will tie really, really nicely into James chapter two. So yes. James chapter two, starting in verse 14, he writes, 
What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. I'll stop there. Thoughts, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, you know, at first glance, if we don't look at the context, it can seem like, oh, this is a problem. You know, James is at war with Paul. Um, and that's, that's not the case, you know. First of all, the, the type of, you know, James literature is not systematic theology like Paul. You know, James is talking about wisdom, wisdom, skill in living. You know, this, this passage right here is talking about our horizontal relationships with other with others. Paul in Romans 4 and Romans 3 and in Romans 5, he's talking about our vertical relationship with God. Um, and th th there's a timeline that it's really important to get because he, he quotes, you know, he's, he's, he's referring to Genesis 22 when Abraham sacrifices his son Isaac. Um, but Paul in Romans 4, he goes earlier to Genesis 15:6. Right. That this was that this is empty hand of faith. He believes in God. He's given a foreign righteousness that he, that he doesn't have without doing anything. But in Genesis 22, much years after Genesis 15, 6, years after, you know, we see the, the fruit of that giving. We see the fruit of his, just, we see the fruit of his justification and he, he produces works. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that that's so key is recognizing that this is not James saying, Abraham was justified by works and Paul's saying, no, he was justified by faith. No, what James is trying to elaborate on is the idea that what Paul was talking about is when Abraham said, I trust you, Lord, that faith was credited to him as righteousness, period, end of story. But that faith manifested itself in tangible yes. works. And those works were evidence to the fact that that faith was true saving faith. And again, I think we need to recognize the faith that causes a man to sacrifice his son, to willingly do that, is only a faith that is worked by God himself, right? Exactly. And so that, that, again, is the thing. This is not James saying, hey, you better in your own strength start showing that that faith is real to prove yourself yeah. worthy of salvation. No, he's saying, if you have saving faith, as Paul used the idea of the vine, right? Uh, the olive tree, if you're plugged into that, that is Christ Jesus, you're going to bear fruit, <laughs> yes. you know, and it's not a result of works so that no man may boast. It's a result of you're plugged into Christ. Christ is going to produce that fruit in you. And if that fruit's yes. not there, that's an evidence, not of the fact that you're not exerting enough effort, but the evidence that Christ is not in you. Right. And so that's, that's the big difference. And again, this can only be understood when our starting point is God. If our starting point is not God as the source of salvation, of faith, of repentance, of all of that, then of course it's going to be read from a perspective of I need to do, I need to do, I need to do. That's so true. That's so, I mean, Calvin writes, I believe in the introduction to book two of his institutes, the source of salvation, all the parts of salvation is Christ. You will not be sanctified apart from Christ. You know, sanctification isn't you muscling, muscling up your own effort justification comes in union with christ sanctification comes in union with christ and ultimately glorification will come in union with christ all salvation should be should come from christ and from christ alone that's so true jesus christ is our justification and our sanctification the bible says that in first corinthians we look to christ if we're going to produce fruit it is the, the reason why we want to we want to obey the commands of god is because god has given us a new heart and we're grateful for what christ has done we understand our depravity and we understand God's holiness and we understand what God had to do to save a wretch like me. 
That is the reason why we, that is the reason why we're obedient to the commands of God out of gratitude of what Christ has done for us. Not because it's a burden, you know, we, we take delight in the law of God. We take delight in his word. We take delight in his commands if we're born again because of what Christ has done for us, that we've been justified and we're being sanctified. Right. Absolutely. Amen to that. And I think, too, when we, when we read scripture, we, we see so many examples of the fact that the works are, are not a result of us. It's, it's not a result of our efforts. You know, Paul, when he writes, he says that we were, that God prepared works beforehand for us to walk in them. We were created for good works and that these wood works were prepared beforehand. And so that idea, again, goes with this idea of God's total sovereignty. The works that you and I are walking in, in righteousness, were prepared and determined by God beforehand so that we might walk in them. Beautiful. And then we read Christ, right? We read that Christ is both the author and the perfecter of our faith. Yep. We also yep. read that Christ who began a good work and you will surely bring it to completion, right? We read that. And then Colossians. Colossians tells us that um, just as you received Christ by faith, so walk in him by faith, right? It's, it's, yep. Everything is wrapped up in that. Yep. Oh, I'm pumped Every, up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Paul says in Romans, everything that does not proceed from faith is sin, you know? Yes. We, everything must be rooted in faith. But, you know, I want to go to a common proof text that, that most Catholics bring out. I don't know why they would go to the, the book of Philippians. It's Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2.12. Yes, this is a common. Let me know when you're there. Will do. All right. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in, in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I mean, they just quote, you know, verse, they, they don't, they, they don't quote verse 13, but they just quote verse 12. Um, I mean, in verse 13 is pretty explicit that it is God who works in us. Yes. That it is the union with Christ. That the only reason why we're producing fruit is we're, we're united to Christ. That he changes our will and to work for his good pleasure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know why they would go to this text, especially what Paul says in Romans 3. I mean, Roman, I mean, I mean, Philippians 3. It's such a beautiful passage. Um, do you mind if we read it? No, oh, yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. Um, verse 2, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else he thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain, I counted, I counted it all as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I mean, Paul uses this Greek word, scubala, rubbish. Um, it, it was translated dung. So Paul says, I, all this, you know, circumcision, my zeal, blameless under the law, I count it all as dung. I count it all as like crap. He counts all of his, his religious deeds, all his might, works. It might even as, be a stronger word than that in the original. Yeah, yeah I, I don't even, I don't want to, it's a really right. scandalous word. Right. I, like he counts it all as crap to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of his own, but the righteousness that comes from God through faith. That's such a beautiful passage. And that is, that is the source of Paul's joy because Paul says joy, like I don't even know how many times he says joy in the epistle of Philippians. But this is the source of his joy, that he has a righteousness, a foreign righteousness, not from the law, not from works, but that comes from God that is based solely on the merits of Christ. Such a beautiful passage. Yeah, and I, I just love too how he, he goes through um, – and, and says, you know, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I of uh, the people of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He goes through yeah. to basically show by any human standard, 
by yeah. any human standard, I am beyond all. <laughs> yeah. And yet I count it all as scuba law, right? He, he just, it's nothing of that matters nothing. except the faith that comes through knowing Christ. I just, I, the, the, I don't think people realize, but <laughs> to me, this passage definitively shows that there is nothing we can boast in. Yep. There's nothing we can boast in except Christ. I don't, I don't know how much more clear you can get because I'm not, I, I'm a Gentile, first of all, but when it comes to obedience, there's no way that I would feel comfortable enough to call myself blameless like Paul is, yep. right? And yet he still counts that blamelessness under the law as total rubbish compared to knowing Christ through faith. Yep. And so I wow. think that this, th this, this passage is so comforting. It is so comforting because the joy that Paul has in Christ is the joy that we all can have in Christ. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's really, it really is. I mean, these, this past, it was, it was Philippians three, you know, the passages that the reformers pointed to, to support forensic justification was Philippians three and second Corinthians five 21. These mm -hmm. passages were really important because you know, the, the righteousness of God through faith, this is, this is essential to understanding the gospel without this, we don't have the gospel. You right. know, the, the cross is the center of Christianity, but also if, if, if it was just, if Jesus just had to die, we just put us to ground zero. Jesus also lived on our behalf. And it's a beautiful thing to think about that I stand in the righteousness of the second person of the Trinity, that, that his, his perfect obedience to the law of God, and he delighted in doing so. He couldn't, he couldn't sin. That is the righteousness that I stand in, a perfect righteousness, not from myself, not from the law, but from God. So yeah. beautiful. And I love, too, that Christ describes himself, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. so we, and <laughs> this will, this will push a little into the eschatology territory, right? But yeah. you know, that, that first resurrection in Revelation 20, you know, that's Christ's resurrection. That's the resurrection of Christ that we are partakers in through faith in him. And so it's this beautiful reality that by faith, I am resurrected. And as Paul writes in Ephesians, I am seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. <laughs> There's no, there's no purgatory. There's no final sanctification. No, I am seated with Christ, through Christ, in Christ. Because he lives, I also live. And that comes by faith, by faith alone. If it was works of the law, no man would be saved. So praise yeah. God, man. Yeah, I mean, there's, just, there's, there's a controversy, um, especially because I, I deal with um, Muslims on on my TikTok, they think they, they believe that Jesus did not teach sola fide. Um, I just I see it. I see sola fide in Matthew uh, Matthew eleven. Yeah. But Jesus says, "Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light." That's explicit. It Jesus is. says, "Come and enter the eternal rest." Because, I mean, that has to do with a little, it's, it's a little bit with covenant theology because we know that Adam, Adam in the garden, he was in a covenant, the covenant of works or the covenant of life. Yep. And the law of God demands perfect obedience. And that's what people who say, you know, I'm religiously unaffiliated, you know, I don't really care. I mean, you should care because you're, you're either seen as a covenant keeper or a covenant breaker. We know that Adam, he, he, he failed his probation in the garden and he plummeted us all into sin. Christ, the second Adam, he passes his probation. And that's what we see in Matthew 4 and in the Garden of Gethsemane where he stomps out Satan. Yeah. He passes his probation, but simultaneously Satan wounds his heel. So we see what I see in Genesis 3.15. I see the active passive obedience of Jesus. That if Adam, if Adam would have passed his probation, the world would have been confirmed in righteousness. And, and we're going to eschatology. And then the next task, the, the next task of Adam was to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. We know that Christ passed his probation because of his resurrection. That is God vindicating him, accepting his perfect work. The resurrection is always linked to our justification. So Christ, when he, when he rose on the third day, because he was innocent, he was just, he was, he was vindicated. He was confirmed in righteousness. And all those who are in him are confirmed in righteousness as well. And through Christ, we can enter that eternal rest because, you know, God rested on the seventh day and he, he invited Adam to come and partake of that eternal rest. 
And that's why in Hebrews 4, that, you know, that we, by faith, we enter that eternal rest. And it's such a beautiful passage, such, you know, Matthew 11, you know, joy, joy to my soul that I have rest in Jesus Christ. And I can't boast about anything. Right. Like the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Yeah. And I, I just want to, I want to touch on this briefly because I think it's, it's just a cool, cool thought, but we look at the seventh day, God rested, right? The seventh day of the day where God rested from his, his labor of creation. And we also see that in, in Daniel's prophecy of the seven, 70 weeks, right? The 70th week, it says that he will make a covenant, a strong covenant with many for one week. Now, a lot of people say that that can't be referring to Christ because it's only a seven-year period. But if we understand the whole idea of the final jubilee, cycle the jubilee cycle within hebrew and we also understand the idea of the day of rest the seventh day we recognize that that 70th week also has the theological imagery of eternal rest the true sabbath rest is in christ right and so i just i find that amazing amazing when when you think about what the sabbath represented which was ultimately pointing to christ and the rest that's found Mm -hmm. in him by faith so we're, we're getting off on so many different, yeah. And so it all I mean, ties, it all ties right back together, which is so beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, I mean, covenant, covenant theology, um, anybody listening, I would just study that because it will bless you because when we understand that Adam was in a covenant, I mean, we know this because of Romans five, you know, Adam was our federal head, but you know, Christ, that's why, that's why, you know, the, the virgin birth is really important because if Christ wasn't born of a virgin, he would have been condemned. Um, Christ is the start of the new humanity. That's why John says, in the beginning was the word. I see that. And that's the starting of the new humanity because Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is, that is the, the, the primary creation. That's the first creation. And then in the beginning was the word, the, the new creation in Christ, that Christ was our federal head, that he represented us day by day, perfect obedience to the law of God. And he also died the death that we can't pay. And it, it's such, it's such, so beautiful. It's, you know, just, it gives, it gives us rest when we stand on what scripture says, when we, I mean, we can even go to what church fathers taught, like Jerome, Augustine, Ignatius, Athanasius, what all these church fathers taught about sola fide. And it's, it's really explicit. It just gives us rest for our souls that, that I have nothing to boast about, that God gets all the glory and salvation that I just become, I'm just part of this story. He, you know, he's the, he's the main part. I'm just, I just get to, or taking his story by faith yeah. and it, it's amazing and that, that to me is the most humbling thing of all is when you recognize how sovereign god is and the fact that he is totally self-sufficient he does not need us he doesn't need any yeah. one of us but the yeah. fact that his grace and his mercy and his loving kindness is so great that he has decided you know the means by which i'm going to glorify myself is through my creation and that i get to partake in bringing him glory Man, it, it just, it makes me want to collapse to my knees. I just, it humbles me to the very, very core of my being. Well, man, yeah. this is, this Amazing. has been a wonderful conversation. As we, as we begin to look more towards a wrapping up uh, application for, for people listening. Yeah, the application is that this is the gospel, you know, remind, you know, Luther said we need to remind ourselves of the gospel all the time because we forget it. Mm-hmm. Um, Christ came, he born of a virgin, perfect obedience to the law of God. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is what God says of the son. God, the father says of the son, never disobeyed, perfect righteousness, blameless. And he also suffered under the wrath of God for our sins. The active passive obedience to the law of God, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Jesus says, come all to me who are weary, laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Yeah. Just fall on Christ. We just, we, we fall, we rest, we, we take the light in Christ, we receive him, we receive his righteousness with an open hand, you yeah. know, you know, nothing to the cross I bring, I'm nothing to the cross, nothing in my hands I bring, solely to the cross I cling. Yes. That is, that is, that is, that is how we come to the cross. You know, those who, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Humble yourself before the cross, receive his perfect righteousness that God can receive you with a positive righteousness, that the estrangement between God and man can be fixed because a righteousness that you don't have has been merited by Christ and the wrath that you deserve has been satisfied by Christ. Christ. That's the application. Just rest and cling to Christ and Christ alone, not your works. Empty hand of faith, trust in Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
And I, I just want to add to that the, the idea of workspace salvation. I think that there are many, many, even within the Protestant faith, who slip back into that. I know I myself do, where we can slip back into that idea that our obedience is somehow contributing to our standing with God. And I just want to encourage the people listening and say that we're not obeying God so that we can have right standing and relationship with God. We have right relationship and standing with God through Christ and faith, and that is why we can obey. And so just yeah. having that perspective is so key because one way is just a constant burden of never measuring up. And another way is the knowledge that you measure up in Christ through his righteousness and his righteousness alone. And that affords you the ability to walk in obedience to the gospel. So, yeah. Brother, would you pray for us and close us out? Yes, of course. Um, Father God, we thank you that we were able to come before you and defend your truth and just discuss about your truth. We thank you for the amazing gift of your son, Jesus Christ. In him, we rest for righteousness, for salvation. He is the author, the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith. Without Jesus, we are hopeless. Without your son, we are hopeless. Without the mediator, we're hopeless. We need you, O oh God. Father God, may you open up the eyes of the listeners, that they may just receive your son and his righteousness, that they will take delight in him and in him alone, that they will, you know, you know, lay off the burden of self-righteousness and, and, and religion and just cling to your son, Jesus Christ, for salvation and experience the joy of God. We thank you, O oh God, for the love that you have bestowed upon us. We pray in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. No problem. Thank you.